The Battle of the Year probably is the biggest breakdance event worldwide. Um, each year in October for the Battle of the Year World Finals, um, we, we have always like eight and a half to 9,000 spectators coming to Germany. We have more than 200 active dancers from breakdance crews participating at Battle of the Year. And the Battle of the Year has a very long tradition. It was founded 20 years ago in 1990 and it began as a very small event and every year grew and today it's probably the biggest. So when I saw breakdancing or b-boying first on TV, which was like 83 probably, I was immediately um, touched and fascinated by it because it was a perfect mixture for me between acrobatic sports and music and culture. So um, the first breakdance wave lasted maybe for two two years but then all of a sudden like nobody was interested no more that the media uh, stopped to report about it and all the dancers disappeared but like me here in Hanover my hometown um, I was still um, attracted and fascinated by, by b-boying and I never understood why from one day to the other it was dying out so I was hunting for other survivors because I said like I can't be the only one being still dancing so um, after after a short while in Hanover I discovered some other people some other kids they also danced and um, we collected more and more people maybe we were 10 to 15 people in the mid and 80s who were still practicing and then um, we were talking a lot what can we do to bring it back to build up a forum again and to show the public that b-boying is still alive and means more to us than just the fashion. So that more or less was the, the moment where, the, where we decided, okay, what can we do? Let's just organize an event. So, and that probably was the motivation um, how the, bat the first Battle of the Year was organized. 
The first Battle of Vier already was an international event. We didn't expect this because when we started, that was 20 years ago, so there was no internet, there were no cell phones, so we only had maybe 20 to 30 postal addresses and we knew only few people in Germany and Switzerland who still did breakdance. So all what we do um, before the first Battle of Vier in 1990, we, we printed posters and we sent the posters out to, to all the addresses we had. And then um, we were really surprised that for the first Battle of Vier already there was a group, a group from England and two or three groups from Switzerland. So the first Battle of Vier actually was already international, which was a surprise to us and of course motivated us to continue for the next year. The Battle of the Year from 1990 grew slowly, every year it got bigger and more international, but in the first years we more or less like had contact to crews from Germany, Switzerland and England, and then slowly other countries came and joined the Battle of the Year and more or less the hip-hop culture. And like after a while, one could really see that at that time um, the dance style is really different depending on from which cultural um, background or from which country um, the dancers coming from. So back in the days, let's say 20 years ago or even 15 years ago, one could clearly see that it's a French style dancer or it's a very acrobatic dancer from Hungary at that time. The first Hungarian group uh, came from, um, was the name Enemy Squad, named Enemy Squad, and they were only always like very acrobatic. So, and, and, and that was always different, for example, um, from the French crews who were more dancing on the rhythm and had a lot of style, but also were very ag aggressive uh, in battling. So those were the, were the individual um, differences. Nowadays, you still can see differences, but it's getting more and more complicated because the kids nowadays download everything on YouTube, they can buy DVDs and then build up their own dancers from what they see on internet and on, on DVDs. So they're mixing up styles, but still if you, if you go to big um, b-boying events or you visit the Battle of Dion stage, and you see 20 different nations, you still can feel whether a group is coming from Africa, Japan or Korea. Nowadays with the internet and emailing, the world is so connected, so it gets much easier to exchange ideas, to exchange video clips, to upload video clips on whatever, MySpace, YouTube. So um, everything is more close together. Uh, and uh, of course, then everything is mixed much more and it's easier to, to copy styles. So that's what's happening today. Today we are living in a very fast environment, the society is living very fast, especially the kids. Like they do something for let's say half a year and then they see, okay, they have no success, so they switch to something different. Which in my opinion is really strongly um, supported by the internet, by other mediums and medias. So that wasn't the fact like back in the days, because uh, like nowadays it is like, okay, you can't say to somebody you meet, okay, I'm hip hop because he's wearing the, the shoes and the, the kangol or whatever. Nowadays he could be even listen to techno electro music, you know. So it's really hard nowadays to, to really put different youth cultures and hip-hop people or b-boys in, in categories, so you can't recognize them. And that's also the fact, like, you have some b-boys, which is good, again, like they listen to, let's say, electro electronic music or even rock music, and they like to b-boy to it. Originally it was breaks, soul music, funk music uh, and rap music, but nowadays everything is mixed, so everything has positive and negative sides. You have uh, different categories of b-boys. You have, you have dancers who still only do the, the old school moves, like the top rocking, the footworks. Then you have b-boys and they are specialized into the power moves, who are more acrobatics. They are spinning on their heads, they are flying around, doing air flares and, and Thomas flares. And um, yeah, and, and you have mixes of everything. Then you have uh, b-boys who more or less listen to uh, punk music, electronic music. They dress up like, let's say, punk people. They don't even look like the b-boys like, like I met them like 20 years ago, but they still do dancing. If we would only like put it on how it was back in the days and don't allow like development, I mean, it wouldn't have been, it would, would not be so interesting and uh, it would be the, in my opinion, this would be the, the death of, of the youth culture, of the development. The biggest battle of the year we ever organized was in the year 2000. 
um, we had uh, a bit more than 10,000 spectators in the location and a bit less than 4,000 outside without tickets watching the, the inside battle outside on a big video screen and that was on the World Expo site in Hanover and the reason for it was like um, at that time different reasons I was not sure if I really want to continue the event after 10 years I said maybe it's too much stress so it's good after 10 years to stop and the Expo uh, with having a big venue might be a good last battle of the year um, and on the other side we were part of the World Exposition which we had in Hanover in the year 2000 for five months and the whole media output which was organized by the battle uh, by the by the expo uh, um, put battle of the year b-boying and hip-hop culture into mainstream medias and attracted a lot of kids let's say mainstream kids who normally don't attend any b-boy or hip-hop events but they were interested in because maybe we, they they listened to rap music or they came from a skateboard background which is kind of also an urban culture so this all together uh, filled up the venue and uh, it was really incredible. In 1999, in Leipzig, Battle of the Year, uh, we only had, I would say, three and a half or four thousand spectators. And at that time I knew already that next year we have a big venue for 10,000 more people. So I was really like sweating, like if we really fill up the venue, because like a big venue being only half full looks like to me dead. So I, n I never expected so many people coming in the year 2000. And it looked developing very very slow until four weeks before the event in 2000 but then all of a sudden the pre-sales went really really fast and we decided I think a week before Battle of the Year in October 2000 we decided to stop the pre-sales because I knew our uh, normal crowd I knew that they come with buses from Holland and Paris uh, France without any tickets because usually you come to Battle of Year and you can buy your tickets on door so we said we better stop and hold 1000 tickets till the day of the event in case of anybody comes without tickets and then on the day of the event I think it was the 14th of October in 2000 in the morning I think at 10 o'clock the pre-sale offices were open and within 10 minutes the last, uh, the last 1000 uh, tickets were sold so this was really amazing The, the b-boying scene is really is really special um, I think it's a scene and the people really like to they are really they want to really treat it uh, respected because they have a lot of love for what they are doing and they invest a lot of energy plus um, I would say mostly the the, the, the kids or the target group doing b-boying or are involved in the hip-hop movement come from um, from social minorities like it was hip-hop culture uh, was born in the South Bronx and Brooklyn and Harlem so poor neighborhoods of New York City in the United States and it was brought up by the immigrants um, in living in the United States like Puerto Ricans and uh, African people and that if you if you transfer this for example to Germany you have a lot of Turkish people Albanian people being involved in hip-hop so they always fight for their rights because normally in society in school the kids have no success so they invest everything they have into for example practicing dancing practicing b-boying and that of of course like um, leads to the fact that they on the one on one side um, they can be really let's say hard to handle plus they are really proud of what they did so you really have to treat them very respectful so this leads to the fact that you every year have discussions with b-boys maybe sometimes only because you can't give them a backstage pass or you can't put them on the guest list or what is also special about b-boy competitions we, we are not talking about a football event or match where in the end you have a referee and you have two zeros so it's very clear who's the winner who's the loser at the battle of the year or any other b-boy competition we have rules we have a judging system but still it's really hard to get for the dancer and sometimes also for the audience why one group was judged better than the other group so this normally is also a very high potential topic to create tension and, and pressure and discussions and stress of course and sometimes this stress gets so much that individual dancers from one group who are a little bit more aggressive than the others even try to uh, knock you out or argue so much with you that they touch you or yell at you so everything even like I have seen even uh, Battle of Thea events where people came up with knives and wanted to stab some of the judges and stuff like this so this is the the worst um, form of having stress and problems at, at events like Battle of the Year. 
And some people even call us Disneyland of b-boying because we, we integrate not only the hardcore b-boy community, we also integrate like families, which was always important for me, old people or older people, because I always wanted to show them what we do, because I think it's more than just a, a culture for the underground and for youth centers staying behind like walls and borders. I mean, the edu educational part was always a strong part of the hip-hop culture from the first day. You know, so the, the original meaning of hip-hop culture is to give kids who have nothing than guns, drugs, fights, a creative alternative to use their creativity and skills for something else. So this actually was the birth of hip-hop. So in the 70s, there were a lot of violent uh, youth gangs in the streets of New York. They were fighting each other and the idea of b-boying was to have a battle, a fight of two persons or two groups but without using knives or guns and without, using, uh, without touching your opponent. So that's the original idea, to, to win against somebody else with a better dance move. That's the idea of, of a battle, that's why we call the battle the battle of the year and by giving kids an opportunity to do something else and giving them a perspective to do something with their skills and to learn something and maybe, whatever, 10 years later, work as a choreographer or work as a professional dancer or work as a professional graffiti painter who's nowadays working in a graphic agency or whatever, designing websites. You know, so this always is a, was and still is a strong part of hip-hop culture and that's also the reason why the social workers always like to work with this hip-hop culture um, elements because uh, hip-hop culture and b-boying, I mean, it doesn't matter from which country you come, which religion, you need nothing, you need no machines, you just can dance with each other and it's working, you know, they need no teachers, they need no social workers because they work with each other. So they teach each other, the older generation is teaching the younger generation and this is why a lot of social worker li workers like, us, like it. And um, this aspect also was, of course, really important from the first year on for us, for Battle of the Year, to not only do the big main event, but beside the Battle of the Year main event, we always did uh, workshops where the good dancers teach the young dancers. Uh, we have panel discussions where people have uh, open, open discussions to discuss uh, things. So this is always, this was and still is very important for me or by organizing Battle of the Year. For us in Europe, our legends come from the United States, come from New York, from the mid-70s when, when b-boying was burned. So my first legends were of course the New York City Breakers and the Rocksteady crew because they, those groups have been the first dancers I've ever seen on TV, like maybe in 82 or 83. So to me, people like Crazy Legs, Frosty Freeze, Prince Ken Swift, um, Powerful Packstar, those are names uh, who are legends for my generation. Um, nowadays, of course, you have, I mean, we have 20 years of Battle of the Year now, so if you, if you talk about legends being around like Battle of the Year history, you could talk about people like Maurizio, uh, a guy from Italy who always had a really different, unique dance style. He was a, a member of a battle squad, a very legendary, famous German group. Uh, by the way, a group the only uh, group who only won, uh, we, they won twice the Battle of the Year, so nobody else did this. Um, and another member of Battle Squad is a very famous dancer and probably a legend is called Storm. He's from Germany. And, um, um, but most of those dancers and legends are not only legends because of Battle of the Year. I mean, we just have a forum, Battle of the Year, and they, they danced at Battle of the Year on the stage. They, some of them won Battle of the Year. But they always have been around on other events also, so they have been not only at Battle of the Year. But Storm is a, a very big legend in, in, the, in the German or worldwide b-boy world. Um, other legends, I mean sometimes people get legends when they die. So, so other people, like for example, there was a famous um, Italian dancer called uh, Massimo Crash. His b-boy name was Crash and he was a really nice dancer from, I think from Bologna. So he died and everybody was shocked and then after a while, like still today, people are talking about him. Or like uh, DJ James Lacey, he was a really positive DJ from, from close to London, from Stansted. And like he was a really positive character. And um, for me personally, uh, he got a really close friend, friend and then all of a sudden he was, uh, he was dead, like by, hit by a car. So of course, 
for the DJ scene, which is really strong related to the b-boys because the DJ play the music for the dancers. Uh, Lacey, James Lacey is a really big legend nowadays. In 1991, we invited probably too many uh, artists from Berlin. At that time, the Berlin hip-hop scene had a lot of so-called hip-hop hooligans, so they came to Battle of the Year with buses and they absolutely destroyed everything. And then a legendary battle, definitely maybe the, the biggest legend or rumor speaking about battles at Battle of the Year is the battle between Battle Squad and Second to None in the year 1992. Because of the reason that Swift and Storm, two legends in hip-hop and breakdancing, had to battle with two people against a group of, I would say, eight or nine English people, plus Maurizio from Italy, who in the year before was in the group of the other side. So they had an argument, and within one year he was changing the side. So they were battling two, two people against eight or nine people, and the two people, Swift and Storm, won. So this battle definitely is legendary. So still, nowadays, people talk about this, and you can see it on YouTube, and people download it, so it's a legendary battle. And then uh, at Battle of the Year 1996, it's more or less a funny story. Um, we, the, the Battle of the Year 1996 was held in a, an old British army barrack, But um, the town of Celle, which is the name of the uh, German city where the Battle of the Year was in 1996, um, somehow bought one army barrack from the British Army and changed it into a big cultural event and youth center. So this was actually the place where we had the Battle of the Year. And the name of the place was still like something like Youth Army Barrack or something. And But still at that time, 1996, there were five or six original army barracks with soldiers from, from, from Great Britain. So there was a bus coming from, from Denmark and there was one spectator, he wanted to get in for free and he went to a, the real army barrack and was swimming through a, a river and climbing over walls until like the, the military police caught him with guns and then delivered him with a wet, wet t-shirt to the, to the event battle of the year in the, in the event location which originally was a barrack but now is an event center so that was one funny story so I was really surprised that somebody took so much effort to get into Battle of the Year by swimming through a channel and climbing walls so I gave him a guest list pass of course and gave him a, a dry t-shirt because he was really poor so that was a legend and funny story at Battle of the Year 1990 we have two hosts at Battle of the Year two MCs who present the event one is coming from Germany His name is Spex, he's coming from Hanover. And the second host is called Trix. He's from the UK, from Nottingham. And uh, this guy called Trix um, always was a little bit messy. So he always lost his plane tickets, his train tickets. He always was late, missing trains and, and everything. So when he went from Nottingham to Leipzig, where we had Battle of the Year 1990, um, he had to first get a train from Nottingham to London Stansted to pick a plane in London Stansted to fly over to Leipzig Airport. So at that time, 1990, I mean, cell phones were already existing, but not everybody had mobile phones at that time. So Trix had no cell phone and we went to the airport, uh, but he was not on the plane as expected. And at that time, I couldn't call him and give him a call and say, hey, what's going on, Trix? Did you, did you miss your plane? Do you come on the next plane? So he had no idea where he, we had no idea where he was. And um, that was a Friday before the event. I mean, Saturday was the event, Friday Trix was not on the plane. So we didn't know what to do. I already spoke to other people who could replace him hosting. There was another guy named Cross One. Like um, I was asking him, hey, he was from the United States and he's, he was organizing events. So I was already asking him if he could hop in Trix's place on the next day in case he's not coming. So I went to bed on Friday and I think it was like three o'clock in the morning in my hotel room, the hotel was ringing. So it was the mum of DJ Lacey, the, the, the DJ who's dead now. And he called me, uh, she called me and said like, listen, Thomas, I have tricks here in my house in London Stansted. And I was surprised because how the hell did she found out that tricks missed his plane or whatever. So somehow they got connected. Tricks was staying in her, in her house. She paid with her credit card a new flight to Frankfurt, not to Leipzig. So at that time we knew that Trix is coming on another plane way too late. I mean, the event was supposed to start probably at 8 p.m. But the plane in Frankfurt 
uh, landed, let's say, 5 o'clock p.m. And from Frankfurt to Leipzig, it's probably, I would say, maybe 300 kilometers. So some of my workers picked him up with a car and was driving back from Frankfurt to Leipzig with 200 uh, miles per hour or kilometers per hour. And um, so they arrived just five minutes before he had to go on stage. I just gave him the mic and he was on stage. So a long story came to an end so be because that was really stressy, a very stressy moment. But in the end, uh, okay, already the day after we were laughing about the whole story. You know, mm -hmm. so. so breakdancing, the original term for breakdancing is called b-boying. The B stands for the break, so you call it break boying because originally the 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 B boys were only dancing to the breaks of a song, the instrumental part. So, um, but even if, for example, like the so-called top rock or up rock is everything you do before you go down on the floor, which is like standing top and moving. But the the top rock or the up rock in the beginning was a separated dance from on its own. It was born in Brooklyn and for this reason it was also called Brooklyn Rock, you know, but later on it was up rock, top rock. So nowadays I would say up rock or top rock is one part of b-boying. Then you have the footworks, which is everything you do on the floor and um, you can say um, this is the original form of b-boying because uh, like back in the days the dance always was acrobatic but not as acrobatic as nowadays. So the original form of b-boying was mainly more or less all around footworks. Um, and then you have the so-called power moves or air moves, which is uh, all the acrobatic moves like head spins, spinning on your head, um, like windmills, air flares, um, flips, whatever. This is called power moves. And then you have freezes, which normally you do like at the end of your solo, you stand still and you freeze. So that means that shows the audience or the, the, your opponent, the other dancer, that, that your solo stops with a freeze. So I would say like if you, if you see a dancer doing a solo, more or less it always starts with an up, up rock or top rock, then you go down, do some footworks, then you do maybe some, some power moves and then you always end up like doing a head spin for example with stopping with a freeze. So you have a complete solo from top rock, footwork, power moves, freeze in the end. So that's b-boying. Some of the basics or, or, or moves like every b-boy should have or usually has is like the, the six step. Six step is a basic uh, step for, for footworks. Then you have spins, you have head spins, you have back spins, you have elbow spins. Back in the days we even had knee spins, but you don't see this anymore. You have uh, different forms of uh, freezes, you have the chair freeze, you have the baby freeze. So there's a whole wide of vocabulary of dancing. So you have like the power moves, you have um, continuous backspin, which developed into windmill. Then you have the Thomas flares, which originally was founded by um, a gymnastic guy named Kurt Thomas, who was in the US national team of gymnastics. And he did the Thomas flares on the pommel horse. So the, the b-boys found this move very interesting, so they did it uh, in, the, in a b-boy solo. So that's a Thomas flare, then you have air flares, you have elbow twists, you have jump turtles, so there's a, a really, really big variety of different moves, which a dancer has, has to have on mind, but then still, of course, it is really, really important for, for being a really good dancer that you have your own signature move, which you maybe invented, so this is very special. And this is really hard nowadays because so many people do it. Everything has been there already, so it's really hard and complicated to really invent something new, but it still happens. And then, if you create this today, then you're a really good special dancer. Storm's first name was Swipes, and Swipes is also a move. And Swipes, Storm always could do the Swipes really nice in different variations, so that's why he called himself Swipes. But then somehow when he went to New York first in the 90s, uh, somebody somehow changed his name into Storm because maybe he was so energetic and powerful, but I don't know why he changed exactly from Swipes to Storm. Also, like what is really important about b-boying and the dance form is the style. This is what you also hear from skateboarders or snowboarders. Style is something you really cannot put in words. It's something like how cool or easy you move, if you smile while you're dancing, if you dance really nice to the rhythm, if you know the songs and you dance on the tunes. For example, you make your moves 
on the on the beats and stuff like this or on some trumpet or whatever you know so if you can do this you are really a stylish dancer for example so you you can see this so some some so-called b-boys are not even dance uh, able to dance on the rhythm so they really look like gymnastic people you know so you, you never should forget that the b-boying is an art form and it's dancing so and dancing always means moving to the rhythm so if you can't dance to the rhythm of course you will ne never get like much respect from the scene or high scores from the judges so yeah if you have everything like originality for example if you have your own moves if you dance to the rhythm if you have a really good and positive or maybe aggressive stage presence if you play with your opponent that makes up a really good and unique dancer the originators like of course they come from from the united states mainly from new york so if i talk about somebody like prince ken swift who uh, was a member of the Rocksteady crew, second generation. I mean, he came from the United States. But then, uh, like that was the birthplace of hip hop and b-boying, New York, New York City. But then it spread all over the United States. So a little bit later, one could find good dancers on the West Coast, in California, Los Angeles, San Francisco. And then, of course, uh, it spread all over. So there were b-boys 84 in Japan in Africa, in Germany, and then in every little continent and country you had your own legends. But some of the legends, for example, in Germany, people like Storm, for example, they turned out being legends worldwide because they, they were representing really hard, they were traveling to other events, and uh, or, or videos were spread. So everybody knew, like, let's say, 90, 90, 90, from 90 to 95, everybody worldwide was only more or less talking about Storm. So the first time I saw breakdancing or b-boying was around, I would say, 83. Um, I was, I would say, 13 years old maybe at that time. And I was watching TV at home and I saw a live broadcasting from the Berliner Funkausstellung. And um, I didn't know at all what breakdancing was at that time. So all of a sudden I saw some people on the stage uh, at the Funkausstellung and they were performing some crazy kind of dance with a jumping, flipping, spinning and I really didn't know what it was but from the first second on I, I, I felt and I, I, I thought okay that's something I have to learn, I have to do also because it's a perfect combination of music and gymnastics or let's say acrobatics combined into a dance form. So that was actually the first time I, I saw breakdancing which was on TV, but actually I'm not sure. I think straight, I tried it in the living room. I tried to do the moves, but you have to see like, um, you saw something on TV, but then it was gone and there was no DVD player or something. I, I didn't even tape it. So you saw something, it was not there, and then you tried to copy it, but it was really hard um, to practice it because there was nothing. There were no DVDs, there, was no, there were no videotapes. So you, everything you created in the 80s was, was made up on your mind more or less so it was really complicated but on the other way it has more open space for your own fantasy and your own cr own creativity nowadays you you, you 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 watch clips on slow motion so it's really easy more or less if you have a good teacher and a good video clip you can learn a move within one week and for me for example to learn a windmill which in the 80s was a really complicated move took me more or less two years because i had nobody showing me and I had no uh, video or um, DVD player explaining how to do this move. At that time, for example, some, some, some uh, movies came into the cinema, like movies like Beat Street or Breakin' or Wild Style. So you went to a movie and expecting, okay, you see something. So you saw the movie sometimes twice or three times and, and then you try to copy it, you know, you try to do it. But um, we were more or less 84, we were the first generation in Europe, so we had no teachers. And New York was far away. I was 14 years old, so I never ever thought about even one day flying to New York because I was 13, 14 years old. So for me, it was an adventure to go to Munich in Germany or to Berlin, but not to New York. So I had nobody teaching me. So of course, you had to uh, think about it, imagine how did they do it. And that sometimes led to funny things because you, you, you created a move, you tried to copy a move you have seen on TV yesterday, but you did it a little bit different. And sometimes it even turned out in a new move. So that was really exciting. It was hard 
because you can imagine like I wanted to, to do the windmill so much but I never found out for a long time how to do it because like I had it not on TV 24 hours so but I remember still when I when I managed to do my first windmill I was really like yes I made it so I really was happy and was like like a big kick for me yeah and I guess that's that was the same to more or less everybody still today if you if you if you manage to do a new move you have seen somewhere and you do it for the first time you are really really hyped or happy you know but nowadays the success is coming really really faster than 20 years ago <laughs> von allen Seiten. Wir können jetzt den Einlass beginnen. Punkt 16 Uhr 32 und 31 Sekunden. Ja, habe ich mit. Danke alle. Jetzt Einlass. Jetzt ist Einlass. Oh mein Gott, das ist von der Kamera. Was ist das? Was ist das? Von der Kamera. Du bist mir noch Bitches. Du bist mir noch Bitches. Mein Name ist Uli Dietze und ich sage ganz herzlichen Glückwunsch zum 20-Jährigen. Yo, this is DJ T from Japan. Yo, what's up? This is DJ Cutmax from the Netherlands. What's up? This is DJ Kid Scram from Sweden. Representing the true school breaks for all you B-boys and B-girls out there, right? Peace. Ich 
20th anniversary battle of the year. It's going to be a great day. Peace. Hello, it's me KitKat, I'm KitKat from Germany and Hanover and I want to say happy birthday battle of the year, 20 years. Let's get it on. This is the dressing room. This is where it starts, all right? So, shall we go in and see what's in? You wanna go in? All right, let's go in. Chico hat seinen Flieger verpasst und wird jetzt äh, von seinem Schwiegervater hierher gefahren, im Auto, aus Mailand. Wir rechnen damit, dass er irgendwann ankommt. Germany. When I started, I was in '83. Hey, this is amazing. Hey, this is for you, Thomas. Big shout and respect for everything you do. That you connect all the big boys together. That we be here. Some of them, they are not my friends, but we are brother to you. Respect and peace. Till next year. Bye. Twenty years battle of the year. I'm happy to be here today. Die ganzen anderen coolen Jungs da oben an Plattentellern, mit allen B-Boys, mit dem ganzen Battle of the Year Team. Ich bedanke mich bei euch für 20 Jahre Battle of the Year und genießt es. Happy Birthday! Ja, ja, alles in Ordnung. Ja, mein Papier, bla bla bla. Alles in Ordnung, alles in Dortmund hier. I'll be dope, man. Yeah. Oh man, it's gonna be crazy, man. Crazy, crazy show. 19 crews, man. Whew. That's a lot. Man, that's a lot of breaking. It's a lot of breaking. Seriously. But yeah, man. Nice that the old school's represented this year, though. For real. What you doing here, man? No, we just wanted... what, what, what do you want? It, now is not the time. To... Go away. Can, just... can somebody get security and get these guys out of here, please? Can, can we get some can security we... here? Like old <laughs> I am old. <laughs> we got that's from my hat, yeah. Grandpa yeah, tricks. tricks. <laughs> the little ducky in the house. <laughs> Sorry. How do I look? How do I look? How do I look? I don't know. Are we good? Come. Are my eyebrows good? Are they good? Are they good? Mm. Dope, dope, dope. You gotta love it. You gotta love it. I'm gonna get changed now, so y'all gotta get out of here, okay? I'm gonna get naked, so see you later. Bye.